Was that John's? Was that your story yesterday? Okay, I was digging that because I played that game a little different. When we had a new item in my shop, I would order plenty of them, which is what he really wants to hear. I would order plenty of them, and I would put the boxes of product. I wouldn't put them on a shelf. I would put the boxes of product in my office under my desk, and I would have one on my station, and when I would be using it on a client and explaining it to a client, I would go, ooh, ooh, you know, this is our new product, OMG, this is what it is, this is what it does, I'm using it for you. And when I was reading through the information, when I was at the class hearing about the new product, I thought of you, I said, this is perfect for Lynn. So I put one in the office for you. Hang on a minute. Then I go back to the office, under the desk, into the box of 24. <laughs> Sorry. And I get Lynn's one. <laughs> And I bring it out, and I bring it to her, and I, I never, I did this a few times, but you know, let's not cross the line into deceptive practices. There's nothing wrong with writing on a post-it note, Lynn, and sticking it on the bottle as you walk out of the office. Yeah. To present it to the client. Because at that point, that product literally belongs to Lynn. That is Lynn's product. Little things we can do that help us along the way. Does that answer your question? Uh, now you've you built more trust, trust with her. You know, sorry. What do you charge for that then? There's no charge for all of this knowledge and information. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's built into <laughs> No, um, After Buzz is 9, sell for 18. Uh, Shape Cream is 12 and a half, sell for 25. Um, the Beard Oil is 6, sell for 12. I bundle it all together. I think if you add those up at retail prices, it's like 49 or something, and let's round it up to 50. I just want to make sure I'm doing it like you. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that really, this is your home and care kit. Now, I played a little game with the numbers. How are we doing on time? When do I go tell? Chris, when do I go tell? She's in charge. Oh, you go to 11.45. We got time. Okay. I did some numbers with this, and um, without looking at my notes off the top of my head, let's say you do five male haircuts a day. Okay? And I do a lot more than that when I'm in the shop. But let's say you do five. And let's say you charge five dollars more for every haircut as a result of the fact that you're going to add this element to your service. Five times five is 25 times five days a week is a bucket of quarters, 125 times 50 weeks a year because you've got a week with John and Nico on an adventure vacation experience <laughs> and another week of vacation, so you've got 50 weeks. $125 times 50 weeks is what? Somebody's got a calculator, play with me here. Everybody has a calculator. Somebody play with me here. It's like sixty-two thousand or something. Sixty-two thousand? No, that's broken calculator. Sixty-two hundred. Well, you're going to charge the numbers. Six thousand two hundred fifty. All right, six thousand two hundred and fifty. That's additional revenue alone. And by the way, I told you you're going to need to spend one hundred twenty-five dollars on a hot lather machine, one hundred twenty-five dollars on a towel cabinet, and twenty-five bucks on a razor. A whole lot of nothing for sixty-two fifty in additional revenue. Now. Operating off that number, of those five haircuts, if three out of five of those customers purchase some of the products we're talking about, I'm not expecting you to sell them to all of them. I'd like your kill ratio to be 100%, but we're not quite there yet, I'm sure. Let's say three out of five buy half the products. So we're going to be reasonable here, setting realistic goals. That means three people per day spend 25 because the three pack comes up to 50. Three people spend $25. 25 times three is? That's $75 a day in revenue times five days a week is? That's $375 a week in additional take home product sales times 50 weeks is? $18,750. By the way, just the purchase of that product alone will have you in Cancun or on the boat next year. That alone will reach your purchase goals. So now we've got $18,750 plus $62,50 in additional revenue. Now, that's just assuming a one shot, but let's take it the next step. Let's say of the three people that purchase product, 66% or two out of three repeat once at some point during the rest of the year. They're going to repeat. They're going to repeat more than that. We know that from the quality of the product. But let's just do the math. If two of these people repeat one time, two times one is two times $25 times two people purchase $25. Well, hey, wait a minute. It's two people times 50 weeks. Two times 50 is 100 times two is 200 times 25. 200 times 25 is? 75 grand, right? 
Yeah, it's another five thousand. Five thousand dollars. So the simple act of taking a moment to clean up cypress, ear areas, and necklines with a razor. Because not only are we enhancing the service delivery experience, but this nape, ear area, and sideburn cleanup exercise is the gateway to the product conversation that is the gateway to the revenue. And forget about it. We're not even going to have the conversation. By the way, we're going to have the conversation Thursday after breakfast with Gino when we get the snacks with Ivan. It's, refer it's my referral program, my new program based on my new book for soliciting referrals. Clients that are having this experience with you, with the razor, with this, do you think they're going to talk about it? Do you think they're going to tell their friends? Do you think their friends are going to show up on the porch? I'm not even going to take you through the potential numbers associated with the referral business you can generate off an enhanced experience for clients, but we added that. So what we've got, we've got 18 plus 6 is 24, plus 5 is 29. We've got almost $30,000 in revenue above and beyond where we were last week from a simple two-minute action with every one of our customers. And you know that $30,000 number is greater than the income of an average licensed cosmetologist in America. The average income in America is less than that $30,000 number. And for all of us, this is bonus. just bonus gravy stuff, exactly. <laughs> this is just on top of all the good things we're doing. Questions or comments, anybody, anything? I have a little bit of time left, and I just want to talk about something that wasn't part of this agenda specifically. I want to talk about the 2020. I want to talk about this decade. I want to talk about where we're going in this decade. Because as humans, we like to divide things up into decades. And we like to say, well, that was the decade of this, and that's the decade of that. And for years, we've been saying, 2020 is right around the corner. Guys, there's a month gone already in 2020. And I want to talk about the history of the barber business in America, specifically speaking from the barber side of things. But there's an incredible amount of overlap into cosmetology. I think a lot of this will resonate with many of you. But it's the answer to the question, folks like me, and some of you are folks like me, are closer to the end of our careers than we are at the beginning. And many of us have, many, some people in the room, many of us have team members and employees and renters and things like that that are closer to the beginning of their career than they are to the end. So the real question is, for those of us that are near the end, we got a decade left, maybe. How are we going to make our money in this decade? What's this decade going to be about for us? And for some other folks, hey, this is their decade. I had my decade. You know, this, they're going to own this thing. This is my decade. This is yours? Good. If you're feeling it, I, I'm going to tell you. And, and you already are on top of it, so we don't have to worry. But here's the deal. Let's go back 150 years. I want to take you on a little journey through 150 years of history of barbering in America. The golden age of men's haircutting, because we're in such an incredible period of revival of men's haircutting and barbering in the United States. It's, how did we get here? And from here, just exactly where are we going? Let's go back, 150 years, 1880 to 1930. Widely regarded as the golden age, 1880 to 1930, the golden age of barbering in America. It was a time when there were more barbers delivering more services for more clients in more shops than at any time in the history of our country. Any city in America, on every corner, there was a barber shop on every corner. And barber, and by the way, delivering more haircuts for more money. Today in the United States of America, on average, Haircuts are cheaper than they've ever been in the history of our country when adjusted for inflation. We as an industry have done a horrible job of keeping pace with the economy. That's why everybody knows about July 1, right? I created a holiday. Everybody going to celebrate with me this year? July 1. What is July 1? Raise your, Raise your haircut prices day in the USA. That is our holiday. We need to be celebrating together. 1880 to 1930. More barbers delivering more services for more money to more clients in more shops, one on each corner in every major city in America. And at the time, barbers were generating 85% of their revenue from one service. Where were barbers making their money? During the golden age. What were they doing? Shaving. They were shaving. 85% of barber revenue during that golden age came from shaving. 1880 to 1930. 1940s, kind of a bit of what we call a lost decade because most of the people who would receive a barber haircut in America during the 1940s were not in America. Where were they? Fighting. Somewhere else fighting a war, that's right. So we kind of lose the 1940s, but then the 1950s came roaring in. <laughs> Largely considered the classic era of barbering. When we think about barber shops, we think about you know, Floyd the Barber in Mayberry, white jackets, porcelain fixtures, classic barbering. Baby boomers, and I'm included in that group, have some of their earliest experiences with barbering with dad, members of the greatest generation taking baby boomers to the barbershop 
during the 50s and into the 60s for those classic haircut experiences. It was a great time. It was a time of some of the greatest prosperity our history has ever known. These people were here in our country building cars and washing machines and growing suburbs and having babies. It's a great time to be an American. And the 60s rolled around. What happened to Barbary in the 60s? Went out the window. Damn near died. Four people were single-handedly <laughs> responsible for almost killing Barbary in America as we know it. You know their names? Who were they? Ringo. John Paul. Paul George and Ringo. That's right. The Beatles showed up and everybody stopped getting haircuts. <laughs> I used to work with the Annis company. Mr. Annis will tell you during the 60s, they didn't turn out all the lights in the factory because they couldn't afford it. It was tough making payroll sometimes because people certainly weren't buying clippers. The 1960s was a very dark time in the barber business. The 70s showed up because through the 60s with that struggle, things changed. What was the one word that really defined haircutting in America? Now we're getting into some of our category here, some stuff we've actually experienced and not just heard about. In the 60s, or 70s rather, what was the word that really defined men's haircutting? Unisex. Haircutting in general. <laughs> that weird little word we don't use anymore? Unisex. Unisex. What, do you, what is that? This was the first time in our history that men and women got their hair cut in the same place. That was weird. The prices were climbing. During the 1970s, as some of you personally know, this was the first time somebody would ever imagine paying $10 for a haircut. That was unheard of. Are you kidding me? $10 for a haircut? That was a lot of money. Barbers cut longer hair. Barbers learned how to do razor cutting and other things to expand their repertoire because hair was long. That was the 70s. Then the 80s rolled around. What defined hair cutting in the 80s? Aquanet? No, no. Aquanet was Aquanet the ladies in the business. Not so much in barbering. That was the Top Gun decade. You had a Tom Cruise and Top Gun. You had Kid and Play, a high top box cut in the urban textured market. All of a sudden, you had geometry, you had dimension, you had clipper cutting for the first time introduced into the beauty end of our business, where Next. barbers had been using Next clippers headroom. for quite some time. The 80s was an interesting time in our industry. Welcome to the 90s. What defined barbering in the 90s? Backstreet Boys. The 90s was the decade of Wall Street. It was the decade of money. Barbershops got bigger. TVs got bigger. Barbershops put big TVs on the wall. Humidors with cigars. Beer in refrigerators. Large overstuffed leather chairs. It, barbershop memberships. With the money that came about in the 90s, Reagan set the table in the 80s, Clinton inherited it in the 90s. We were spending big money in the barber business for the first time in many, many years. End of the decade, end of the century, welcome to the zeros, what happened to barbering in the first decade of this century. We gave it away. All the gains that happened in the 90s were given away. Who did we give it to? We gave it to Jennifer. We gave it to Samantha. We gave it to Elizabeth. We gave it to female cosmetologists cutting hair in low price, high volume, family oriented chains. The zeros was the decade of the explosion of chain salons in our country. Cut. Quickie cuts and zippy cuts and crappy cuts and nappy cuts and all of the chains <laughs> that opened up out there at a low price became the de facto new barbershop of our industry. And welcome to the teens. We just finished this decade. What drove the, what, what is responsible for the explosion we've seen in men's hair cutting and what drove our business this past decade? All the crappy 15-minute cuts. No, no, no. no. Chains are doing their thing, and they're not crappy. With all due respect, <laughs> chains cut hundreds and thousands of haircuts in our country every single day nationwide, coast to coast, and almost all of them are perfectly good. And as a percentage, none of them are any worse than what we do in beauty shops and bars. They're just low price options. There's 328 million people in America. They all want to buy haircuts. Many of them want to buy them at a chain. There's nothing wrong with it. We can't be trash talking these guys. They represent a vital link in our system. But that's not what the teens were all about. What were the teens? What drove our business in the teens? And the important part of the story is it will not drive our business this decade. Diversion? Social media. Social media drove our business for the last decade. And for all practical purposes, social media will never go away. But social media is evolving fast. As an example, Instagram is over. Instagram is pretty much done. We have learned. They, they hooked us, they fooled us, but we're not going to be fooled for long. Instagram used to be me looking at my friends and their cool stuff. Instagram is now, Instagram will tell you themselves, Instagram will show you 7% of the people you follow. That means Instagram is telling you right up front, 93% of the people you care about you're never going to see. And what are you going to see instead? Advertising. advertising. Instagram is paid advertising. I grew up with TiVo. TiVo told us you don't have to watch ads anymore. 
and they figured out how to give us ads all day. Anyone who spends a significant amount of time on Instagram is giving people their eyeballs and their time in exchange for advertising. The platform, the platform is, so is Facebook, the platforms are fundamentally broken. YouTube is experiencing its own kind of resurgence now. All of a sudden, YouTube has become a relevant platform for a lot of folks, where it's been popular, it kind of died off, became popular again. And what's, the, what's the, the, the platform of now? Not the future and not the past. What, anybody know what the platform of now is? So Talk to my, I got a 21 year old and 27 year old. Yeah, TikTok. TikTok. I can't create a profile on TikTok and my younger, my 21 year old's like, Dan, you're not a 13 year old girl, what are you doing on TikTok? <laughs> okay, I'm trying to learn what TikTok's all about, but it's a video Snapchat. posting site. They're done, no, my kid won't even go on Snapchat anymore. They're done with Snapchat, they've moved on from there. So social media, what drove in the last decade, will not drive the future. In order to understand what's gonna drive our future, how did we get here and where are we going, we have to go back and we have to answer the question, what happened to the golden age? I told you the golden age of Barbara, 1880 to 1930, a 50-year period in which more people made more money than ever before in our country in Barbara, and then they didn't. It rolled over and died. And my question for you is, who killed it? And in order to understand what killed the Barber business, we have to explore this. We have to go back. We have to go back to Chicago, many of our hometown. Our story starts in Chicago with a guy by the name of King Camp Gillette. You ever heard of this guy? He was born in Wisconsin, Gillette. he moved to Chicago. Mr. Gillette was a Chicago. Mr. Gillette was a salesperson, he wasn't a barber. Mr. Gillette was kind of an odd guy. If you ever get a chance to read his biography, it's fascinating. He was absolutely a socialist. He wrote a book called The World Corporation that talked about the idea of a utopian society. He had some crazy ideas, but some of his ideas weren't so crazy. Mr. Gillette, moved his family from Chicago to Boston, Massachusetts. In Boston, Massachusetts, he set about finding his fortune. He was a salesperson. He sold cork liners, little circles of cork that went inside bottle caps that went on beer bottles. And one of the things he noticed about the little circles of cork that he sold inside the bottle caps that were sold to people to put on the tops of bottles were, when they opened a bottle, what did they do with the cap? They threw it away. They threw it away. Mr. Gillette recognized that this was the first example of disposal. If you're an environmentalist, you're not so crazy about Gillette. Gillette largely discovered and invented the concept of throwing things away. Now, Mr. Gillette looked at our country and he said, America's going to be a great country. It's going to be a great nation growing every single day. There's going to be a lot of people in America. And in order, he was a salesperson, in order for me to be successful, I need to sell something to everyone in America. But in order to sell it to everyone, number one, they need to throw it away and buy another one. And in order to sell them something they're gonna throw it away and buy another one, it better be cheap. Now Mr. Gillette combined this sales opportunity with some of his strong personal feelings about religion and other things. Mr. Gillette was not a fan of barbershops. Mr. Gillette at the time, remember, barbers visited a barbershop two or three times a week. He felt that the time spent in a barbershop was time that could be utilized in more productive ways. It was wasted time and energy. He also felt that barbershops were places where men engage in unsavory conversations about things they shouldn't be talking about. That is exactly why I work in a barbershop. Okay? However, he combined all these ideas and came up with the notion of shaving. Mr. Gillette set out to invent the disposable razor blade. Now the story tells us that as he experimented with blades, his early blades he had a problem. The blades were too sharp and they stayed too sharp too long and he didn't need to throw them away. But he kept working. He was not to be deterred. Allegedly, the story goes, he was visiting a friend who was a clock maker and a clock repairman. Now you've got to remember back in Gillette's day there were no batteries. Every clock on the wall and every watch on your wrist had to be wound or your pocket watch had to be wound by a spring. Well, legend has it there was a large clock spring lying on the workbench. And Mr. Gillette looked at this coil of steel and said, what if, rather than machining my blades, what if I stamp them? What if I punch them out of this thin strip of metal? Now, if you Google Mr. Gillette on Google Images, there's a famous picture of him holding up a strip of metal with little razor blade shaped holes in it. I think it's actually a drawing, not even a photograph, because of the time in which it was taken. But it's a famous photo. Today, if you go on YouTube and you look up manufacturing double-edged razor blades, you'll see machines feeding thin strips of steel and punching out blades. 120 years later, the process hasn't changed. 
but he finally got it right. Mr. Gillette finally had a razor blade that was very, very sharp, cut very, very clean, very, very well, and got very, very dull, very, very fast. He was going to be successful. He took his blades, his razor blades, to the barbers of Boston, Massachusetts. And when I tell the story, I picture this man in a trench coat, a heavy coat, with a backpack full, it was probably not a backpack, but with a backpack full of razor blades, visiting the barber shops of Boston, Massachusetts, on street corners, coming in and saying, hi, my name is King Camp Gillette, and I bring you the future. In the future, your customers will shave at home with blades that you bought from me that you sold to them. I will sell them to you, you will sell them to your customers, and we will make money together. Now, what did the barbers of Boston, Massachusetts say to Mr. Gillette? Get out. Get the hell out of my store. <laughs> I'm making 75% of my money from shaving, and you're telling me I'm not going to shave anymore? I don't like you, and I don't like your vision of the future. Bye-bye. And he went across the street to the next barber shop. And he came walking in, and he said, my name is King Camp Gillette, and I bring you the future. In the future, your customers will shave at home with razor blades that they bought from you that you bought from me. I will sell them to you. You will sell them to your customers, and we will make money together. And what did the barber say to Mr. Gillette? Get out of my store. This happened over and over again. And I picture, like, in the 1880s in a, in a saloon with the swinging doors, they throw him out in the street, and he tumbles into the dust, and right behind him comes the backpack. And he dusts himself off and moves on to the next barber shop. Well, Mr. Gillette was a salesperson. He was not to be deterred. After being thrown out again from one more barber shop in Boston, Massachusetts, he dusted himself off, and he walked down the street, and he went someplace different. Where did he go? Went to a place we call the chemist back then. Today we call it the pharmacy. And he walked into the pharmacy and he said to the man at the pharmacy, my name is King Camp Gillette and I bring you the future. In the future, people will shave at home with razor blades they bought from you that you bought from me. I will sell them to you. You will sell them to your customers and we will make money together. What did the pharmacist say to Mr. Gillette? Hey, give me some of them blades. Let's see how that works. Fast forward. 120 plus years later, today, in America, it's hard to find a real barber shop. And on every corner in every major city, there's a Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, Rite Aid. The drugstores are everywhere. So my question for you is, who killed the golden age of barbering? Barbers killed the golden age of barbering. Because a gentleman presented himself at the door and said, Hi, my name is King Camp Gillette, and I bring you the future. And a whole bunch of barbers went, Nah, nah, I'm not interested in your future. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm out. Are you aware of the fact today, 93% of the population of the developed countries of the world, 93% of the people in the world begin their day by giving a couple of pennies to Mr. Gillette. The Gillette Corporation is now part of Procter & Gamble. It's still headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. They're widely diversified. They make razor blades and aftershave and soap and deodorant and cologne and all kinds of other products, all of which are disposable all of which are relatively inexpensive. And 93% of the world gives that man money every single day. Now, my name is Ivan Zoot, and I bring you the future. <laughs> the future of the professional beauty and barber industry is the use, suggestion, and recommendation of professional take-home hair care product. The 20s is the decade of retailing. It is the decade of average ticket because you can't cut any more hair. You are bound by an equation I call two hands and one ass. That's right. You can only be in <laughs> one place at a time and you can only do two things at a time. And you've got a limit. My blog last week, for those of you that follow me, I blog on my website. I have a, and, and now I've gotten to the point where it's one subject every week. I talk about it on a YouTube video. I talk about it on audio post. I, I write about it in a blog post. And I'll give you all the information on where you can follow and find all this stuff. Last week's subject, maybe this week's subject, because I lose track of what, no, it was last week's subject was you, as a hair cutter, have an expiration date. You're only good for so many haircuts. You're only good for so much time. Gino talked about it earlier. You're going to die. You better have fun. But you only got so many haircuts. If you only have 246,931 haircuts in your career, you better charge more for all of them. And every one of these people, you better dig a little bit deeper in average ticket. And the single easiest way to drive average ticket with two hands and two hands is the use, recommendation, and suggestion of professional take-home hair care product. 
Track your average ticket. Your average ticket, total amount of revenue in the week divided by the number of butts in your chair, that's average ticket. Let's not make this rocket science. Your average ticket is reflection of your bottom line efforts. That number must be quite. And the easiest way to move it, the fastest, is with product. Take home hair care product is the employee that receives no benefits. Take home hair care product is the employee that never calls in sick. <laughs> Take home hair care products and employ it doesn't receive a whole lot of commission. It's a beautiful thing. Questions about anything we talked about, anything we didn't? All right, I will be back with you guys on Thursday. We're going to be talking about the new book. This is 100 by 100. This is 100 new haircut customers in 100 days guaranteed. This is Thursday. I will tell you, from Thursday, 100 days is May 6th. I looked at my calculator and I did a little math to figure it out. <laughs> I will per and money back guarantee. This is a program. It's a day by day, step by step program. You do what's in this book. 100 days later, I will guarantee you have 100 new customers. And whoever you are in the business, no matter where you are in our industry, 100 customers changes your life. If you're the newbie, if you're the rookie, if you're an owner, if you're hiring and training and developing, 100 new customers puts a new hair cutter on the map that establishes a base of business and it rocks their future. If you've been around a little while and you're building and growing, 100 new customers transforms your book. 100 new customers takes you from, yeah, you come in whenever you want, I got a lot of time, to you better pre-book. Because if you don't pre-book now, you won't get in it. And if you're an experienced professional with a full book, 100 new customers blows up your chair. 100 new customers levels up your game. It takes you to your next price increase. It takes you to your financial future. Questions about anything I talked about or anything I didn't? You're awesome. Yeah. Okay.